The Summer Day Who made the world? Who made the swan and the black bear? Who made the grasshopper? This grasshopper, I mean. The one who has flung herself out of the grass. The one who is eating sugar out of my hand. Who is moving her jaws back and forth instead of up and down. Who is gazing around with her enormous and complicated eyes. Now she lifts her pale forearms and thoroughly washes her face. Now she snaps her wings open and floats away. I don't know exactly what a prayer is. I do know how to pay attention, how to fall down into the grass, how to kneel in the grass, how to be idle and blessed, how to stroll through the fields, which is what I have been doing all day. Tell me, what else should I have done? Doesn't everything die at last and too soon? Tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? Mary Oliver Welcome to Self Talk. I'm Rachel Astarte. I promised you that poem, or at least the subject of that poem, in the last episode. Tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? What makes it so hard to answer that question is that we have no idea what that wild and precious life looks like. It often doesn't feel so wild. Crazy, maybe, yes, but it doesn't feel that wild in the good way or precious. We're too bogged down in the mire of life, the traumas and the angers and petty nonsense that holds us back from shining, from becoming that idealized self we know is out there somewhere. And that's what I want to talk about today. Whatever it is that we do to become our highest self, whatever path we take, it's all heading in the same direction. Whether you choose meditation, or yoga, or psychedelics, or marijuana, or fasting, or being a whirling dervish, or whatever it is, whatever path we take to get there, it really is the same. It only matters how long it takes us to get there, and how long we stay connected. Taking the slow route through contemplation and silence, awareness, meditation, we have a chance to immerse ourselves in the process of awakening. Drugs and plant medicine are more like a round-trip bullet train. We can catch a glimpse of connectedness, take a few snapshots and selfies, but then we have to race back as the drug wears off. You can be transformed by it, but it takes more of the slower stuff like meditation and in-this-moment awareness to really hold the gifts that you received and integrate them into your life. So let's talk about drugs just for a second. Not all drugs are equal. Alcohol, for example, it's natural, but it doesn't take you up and out. It takes you down and under. And that may be okay for some people, but it's not getting you along the path. What we're talking about here is the path, the path to becoming your highest self. So there are many ways to get there, many ways to get there. The point is that everyone is different. As long as we're all heading in the same direction, I don't see a difference in whatever vehicle a person chooses. We're all going to arrive at whatever we need to arrive to in this life by many, many different paths. There are a hundred ways to kneel and kiss the ground, as our friend Rumi writes. So it doesn't really matter how we get there. Whatever path you're on, that's the path you're on. So be okay with it. Keep heading in the direction you need to head in toward your highest self. The fact that you know the path is there means that you're heading in that direction. Let that be enough. So there's not this idealized being out there when we say your highest self. And we're going to talk about that in a second. This is not a destination in a physical sense, in a, in a distance sense. The process is something that is much more internal and integrated. And we call it self-work or working on yourself. I'm working on myself. The work is not the work. You're not working on yourself 
to get to be a certain way somewhere out there in the distant future. There is no ideal you out there in the ether that you're going to become. I, I hear this with clients a lot. There's this, I don't like where I am right now. There's a person out there that I want to be and I can't get there. The highest self is already within you. You listen to that person every day. Every time you're aware of something that doesn't feel right to you, the being that doesn't feel right is your highest self, is your true self. So I have these habits. I don't like them. I hate it when I get angry. I don't like this person that I am when I get a certain way. I'm not good enough. I'm worthless. I'm unlovable. The voice that recognizes the state that you are in as out of balance, that's your highest self. You are already living that person. That person is already in you. So the real work is embracing the emotions that you have, the difficulties that you have as part of you, as part of that beautiful warning system that says, hey, I'm off balance. That is something to appreciate and respect. It's your self self-regulating system. That's all. So I don't actually even like to call it work. I prefer to think of self-development or self-inquiry as a restoration. Imagine a beautiful piece of art, perfect in itself, and as time goes by and dirt gets on it and age shifts it and alters it, maybe it gets banged around a bit, someone recognizes that this is not the original beauty and says, let's fix it, and then begins the restoration. Each painstaking corner of that work of art needs to be cleared with love, with tenderness, with reverence in the touch. When we restore ourselves to our original beauty, that which we had before birth and at birth, before whatever traumas befell us as our lives went on, when we restore ourselves to that pristine oneness that we are, that spark of the universe, it takes a gentle hand. It's an act of love. If you see yourself as your negative emotions, then you're adding dirt to the beautiful piece of art. The very fact that you recognize a restoration is needed, that's the higher self. That's the true self saying, there's something off, let's fix it. Now maybe some of you are asking, well, where's the ambition in that? What else am I contributing to the world? Isn't it selfish to just do me and not work for the greater good? Shouldn't I be doing something that gives back to the world? Drop ambition. Just do the restoration and you will be giving back to the world. You will be offering one more human being who is not triggered by small disappointments or misspoken words or other people's pain that gets flung at you in desperation. You will be contributing to our world family a being who feels for others, honors their path wherever they are on it, a being who honors life around it, a being who steps into the swirling pool of living creatures and nourishes it, not poisons it with your very presence. This is the noblest cause a life can have, I think. Let's go back to Mary Oliver. I do know how to pay attention, how to fall down into the grass, how to kneel in the grass, how to be idle and blessed, how to stroll through the fields, which is what I've been doing all day. Tell me, what else should I have done? So if you do one thing with your one wild and precious life, let it be enough to restore yourself to your true nature. That's enough. It's hard work and it takes time, but it's beautiful, painstaking, gentle work. And if somewhere along the way you find yourself in a position to help others on a large scale, fantastic, do it. But don't for a second think that you're not already immensely powerful and influential just as you are. Stay on your path whatever path it is that brings you closer to yourself, your true nature, to source, which is your home. You are the journeyer and everyone and everything around you is touched by your presence. Every day, all the time. So what are you going to do with that wild and precious honor? As always, send thoughts and questions. You can email me at rachel at selftalkpodcast.com. Until then, Many blessings on your path. I'm Rachel Astarte. Thank you for joining me on Self Talk. Aho.